Welcome to another episode of Let's Be Perfectly Queer. I have got a very special guest on tonight's episode. It's Pride Month, and what better way to acknowledge Pride Month than with one of my favorite movies of all time, the movie Pride uh, from 2014. Uh, it's about the uh, the miners' strike in in Wales back in 1984-85, and uh, the support of the miners by the lesbians and gay. Lesbians and gays support the minors, LS, LGSM, it's a mouthful. Uh, anyway, one of the uh, individuals portrayed in the movie um, is joining me on uh, tonight's episode. The wonderful Jonathan Blake is here all the way from London in the UK. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you, Randy. It's really great to be with you. Well, I, I've gotta say, I have, uh, I've been wanting to have you on the show for, for some time. Uh, I feel like I've known you forever. Um, but we really only just connected, uh, what, October or November of, of 2020? And I think that was through um, your participation in the I Can Give You campaign. Yeah, and I have to say that campaign, I thought, was just genius. Oh, really, I appreciate really special. No, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really powerful sort of um, piece of, uh, of, uh, of, of information for people and really positive. And that's, that, I think, is really important. Yeah, that's certainly the focus that I, I intended in it. In, uh, I mean, you're wearing the U equals U shirt. That's uh, certainly a cause that is near and dear to my heart. And I love the idea that those of us living with HIV who are able to uh, achieve an undetectable viral load can't pass on the virus. But I just, I wanted the focus to be more on what we can give because there's so much more that we can give other than just that one aspect of ourselves that we can't give, thankfully. So yeah. uh, that's... I think, and I think that that's what was really important because so often everything is very negative and sort of and muted. So your campaign was something that was just really, really sort of positive and, and upbeat, as well as giving the message. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That uh, that means a lot coming from uh, from a long term survivor like yourself, Jonathan. So I didn't want to have a, a long introduction before we began the show because I really want to hear your story, and I just want to. Um, let the viewers know that a, a very small window of your life um, has been shown to to the public in the movie Pride, um, yeah. and I'm sure it was somewhat fictionalized to a, to a certain degree. I know it was uh, based on on true events, but I know that uh, you know the Jonathan Blake portrayed in in the film isn't necessarily uh, the real Jonathan Blake. Uh, but I'd really love to hear more about um, the Jonathan Blake story. Uh, I know you are coming up to birthday number 72. And when I look at you through, uh, through the wonders of technology, I would never guess that. So that is kudos to you, my friend. Um, oh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to talk to someone who has been living with the virus as long as you have and has been living with it really since the onset of the pandemic. And if I'm not mistaken, you were one of the first individuals in the UK to be diagnosed as living with HIV, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my hospital number at the Middlesex Hospital um, was London One. So I was wow. the first at the Middlesex Hospital diagnosed with, uh, with it was then called HTLV3. Right. Um, and um, I mean, it was, it was, they were dark days. They were really, really sort of dark days. Um, when they sort of, they, 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 they what happened uh, essentially was that every single lymph node in my body just erupted. And I was walking around like a gorilla. I couldn't put my arms by the side of me. Sort of my groins were just sort of uh, made me sort of walk bandy legged. And I made an appointment to go and see my GP who I was li living at that point in the East End. And as I walked in, she stood up and she put out her hand and she said, shake my hand. And as I shook her hand, she felt the lymph node there. And it was really painful. I said, well, ah, what did you do that for? She said, that's the sailor's handshake. She said, whenever the sailors went into port, they would shake the women or the men's hands that they went with, and they would feel that lymph node. And if that lymph node was up, it was a sign of syphilis, and they wouldn't go with them. So mm -hmm. she said, have you been to the, uh, the um, special clinic recently? I said, no, I haven't. So she said, well, I think you should go. So I went off at that point, I was going to James Pringle House, which was part of the Middlesex Hospital. And I went there and suddenly they were all over me. 
and they wanted to do a biopsy, so they took me in. And in those days, if you were queer, you were always put in a side ward. So you wouldn't kind of, you know, infect anybody with your queerness. I mean, it's right. crazy, crazy, crazy. But anyway, so I was, I was in this sort of side ward and they did a biopsy. And I was then kept there for two days. And they then came back and they said, you have a virus. It is, um, we have nothing to treat it with. Um, basically, it's a terminal diagnosis. You have about six months to live. And that's it. There will be palliative care. Go home. <laughs> wow. I mean, I was just totally shell-shocked. And you and were I, how old at the time? I was 33. Okay. 33, I sort of, you know, worked for 10 or so years as an actor, and I just felt my life was over before it had even started. Sure, I bet. Uh, and I sort of went back to my sort of, uh, my flat in the East End, and I kind of closed the door, and I just shut off. I just shut down. I didn't get in touch with people. And in the December of that year, I decided that, that I'd heard enough. I, I had lived in New York in, in 1974. Um, I'd been to San Francisco in 1981. I had friends in, in the States. I was hearing what was happening, and I just thought, I can't deal with this. So I decided that I was going to run a hot bath, and I would sort of take a few pills, have a few drinks, and I would just slip my wrists. Mm -hmm and leech out and of course the voice of my mother came on my head Jonathan you clear up your own mess you don't leave it for others to clear up and I just thought I am going to leave one hell of a mess right and so I just I couldn't do it so then it's a question well what are you going to do you know how is one going to sort of you know get over this I have got this killer virus coursing through my veins I don't want to infect anybody um, how on earth am I going, to, what am I going to do? How am I going to live? And I used to sort of go off to bars, but I would always stand in the corner because I wanted to be with people. But of course, I didn't want to, to, to talk to anyone because what am I going to say? You know, how am I going to tell them that, that I've got this, this, this killer virus? Um, I mean, it, it was just, it was, it was really, really bleak. And I remember sort of one day I picked up a copy of a, 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 a news sheet called Capital Gay. And it, there was this tiny little advertisement. Gays for a nuclear free future are running a coach going from gays, leaving from gays the word on the 1st of April, 1983, going to this stand together around Greenham Common, the American air base and women's camp. Burfield and Aldermaston, which were the two British nuclear establishments, um, and they were going to form basically a ring around it, people holding hands. And I thought, all right, that's going to be my entry into society. So I remember on, on the 1st of April, it was a Saturday, I kind of girded my loins and, and I set off from my flat in the East End to, uh, to Marchmont Street, to Russell Square, and I remember coming out of Russell Square Tube Station and I could see the coach way up by Gaze the Word Bookshop. And I just thought, what the f am I doing here? <laughs> and I was about to literally swing on my, my, my heels and leave when this voice said, hello, my name's Nigel, who are you? Mm. And I stopped. And I looked, and, and, and there was this, this young guy who was wearing um, crimson and ochre pantaloons, green Wellington boots, a blue sweat, feral uh, singlet, and this mass of black hair, you know, curly hair. And Sounds that was fabulous. Nigel Young. Yeah, absolutely. And that was Nigel Young. And we just spent the whole day together, you know, I told him about my diagnosis. I don't think he heard. I think it just washed over him. I don't know. But we were just yabby, yabby, yabby. Had a, a fantastic day. Wow. And then at the end of the day, uh, we were all invited to um, a, a party in a squat in West Hampstead um, given by uh, Noel Gregg, who 
I knew from Gay uh, Sweatshop. He ran Gay Sweatshop. So anyway, we went there, still chatting away. And the next day, I invited him to come and have tea over in the, in the East End. So he arrives the next day. He brings tea. He brings a bunch of anemones and two jam donuts. <laughs> what could be better? And he basically said, look, you're living isolated in the East End. I, at the moment, am living up in North London in a squat, but I know of a squat in Brixton. Why don't we move in together? And I wow. just thought, you know, I'm going to be dead in a matter of months. Why not? So we just did it. He knew someone who wanted to sublet my flat. That was fine. And we did. And we're still together. I mean, all these years later. That's incredible. Well, but yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's just been incredible. And he was incredibly politically active. He'd been a member of the Gay Left Collective. So it was he who really got us involved with lesbian and gay men support the minors, because the moment that, that, that sort of, you know, this was on the cards, yeah, we were, we were in. And it was, for me, it was really interesting because um, when I had worked as an actor, or been working as an actor, in 1972-73, I did pantomime at the Swansea Grand Theatre. I was playing the, uh, the genie of the lamp in Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the miners' strike created this, what they call the three-day week. So you had electricity for three days and four days you didn't. So the theatre got in a, a, a ship's fog light and a generator. Um, so on those four days, the show could go on. I mean, it was white light, <laughs> but <laughs> the show went on. And it was amazing. So, of course, sort of, I had memories of that. So the idea of actually supporting, you know, miners in South Wales, yeah, that was, that was great. And, of course, my mother was, was, was born in, uh, in Swansea. Her father was the rabbi there. Oh, wow. Um, and then in the March of, of 1914, they emigrated to Canada. So they first went to Winnipeg. And then for some reason, and I don't know, why and of course my parents aren't around or my mother isn't around to ask the question he turned reform so he was orthodox went to winnipeg turned reform and then moved to um, to montreal hmm. and so in 1924 they moved to montreal and then in 1926 he died at the age of 24 of a massive heart attack and they were left penniless and so they sold everything to get their passage back to England. And my mother's aunt, so my mother's mother's sister, had married a man called Louis Silkin and was living in Dulwich. So they moved back and they, they moved there. So sort of, uh, so it was extraordinary. So hence, you know, A, I'm here and What's interesting is that I'm now living in Herne Hill, which is in South London, and just down the road is Dulwich. And when my parents eventually came to where I'm living, you know, I was thinking, I can't tell my parents that I am living, you know, off Relton Road, because all they'll think of is the riots, you know, the riots of 1981 and, and what's his name. But I'm living here, so I must tell them. So I told them, and my mother went, oh, well, that's lovely. I used to walk down Relton Road every day to catch the bus from um, Brixton down to the Elephant and Castle where she went to school. And she remembered it from 1926. And of course, in those days, it was very smart. Right. So in her head, this was wonderful that I should be living here. <laughs> Well, perfect. That's, it's good that uh, sometimes our parents feel that way, whether yeah, it's yeah. true or not, right? Occasionally, occasionally. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the depiction of, uh, of Jonathan Blake um, by Dominic West in, in the movie Pride, how close is that to, um, to what the reality was of that time for you, Jonathan? You know, it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, in a way, I don't think it's close at all. But there is a truth 
to it. And I, I really think that, 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 that Stephen Beresford um, has written a really brilliant script, you know, and it's got humour. And so those, those moments that, that, that people might kind of get turned off, suddenly they just get caught again. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I mean, they were amazing times. And of course, for me, it was even more incredible because it was displacement activity. And for me, displacement activity is always important because that's the way that, that you keep yourself busy so you're not having to think about your diagnosis. You're not going to you know, have to think about sort of, you know, what is waiting around the corner for you. So, you know, the more that I could sort of, you know, keep doing things, um, the better it was. So this was just was just fantastic. And I mean, the, the mining community, I mean, what they gave to us, you know, their generosity of spirit, given that they are under attack. Um, you know, we knew as, 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 as gay men, certainly, we knew what the power of the state was and how miserable they could make their lives, you know, our lives if they wanted to. You right. know, the miners were, were, were the aristocracy of the working class. They had no idea of what they'd let themselves in for. I mean, they sure found out. I mean, you know, they found out there, they found out in Orgrave. Um, so the fact that, 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 that they just offered us, I mean, they welcomed us with, with open arms. It was, it was quite extraordinary and it was wonderful sort of going down there. And of course, we're still con connected. I mean, you know, all these years on, we're still connected, you know, with, with people down there and families down there. And, and you know, for me, particularly sort of Sean James, um, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, amazing, an absolute yeah. sort of, you know, yeah, and I think it's 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 amazing what that um, what that initially a, a small initiative um, through um, lesbians and gays support the miners has turned into you know human rights for for queer yeah. folks in the UK. I mean that is that is really what is amazing is is the fact that it was the South Wales miners who put pressure on the National Union of Miners to use their block vote to get lesbian and gay rights onto or into the Labour Party's manifesto. And lots of people, you know, over the years had tried to do it and it had never happened. There were always excuses why, why it couldn't. But this time with the, the block vote of the NUM, um, it happened. And, and that is amazing. And from yeah. that, we got civil partnerships. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, just outstanding. And, and I, I, I can't say enough um, good things about the movie. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I've watched it. I, I can't even count the number of times that I've, uh, I've watched the movie, and it always, <clears throat> it always leaves me laughing. It leaves me crying. It's, it's a roller coaster, but it is, it's such a fun movie. And you're right. Um, Stephen Beresford's writing is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. So oh, yeah. uh, no, he, he really sort of, he did us proud. He did us proud. Yeah, and I know I've I've got a bit of a fetish for for t-shirts, and I've been on the hunt. Uh, I was actually just on the internet today trying to find a uh, Pits and Perverts vintage t-shirt that I could purchase somewhere. I've oh, yet to find it, but <laughs> wow, vintage one. I mean, you know, gays the word has got them printed new, but vintage, wow. I have, I have even, even new. I, I don't think I could find them on on the internet that would uh, ship to Canada. So I'll, I'm quite uh, sure that gays the word will, and if not. I will send you one. I, I will make some arrangements then when we uh, get off the air for sure. So one of the things, obviously, as, as someone living with HIV myself um, for a much shorter period of time than yourself, I've been living with HIV for a little over six years now. Mm -hmm. um, we're celebrating 40 years, roughly, um, since uh, yeah. the, uh, the idea of HIV and AIDS first came to light in the world. I think we, we know that it was around... Um, certainly prior to 81, but 81 was when the light started to, uh, to shine on it. And, uh, and I, I speak to a lot of uh, folks and have had the, the great honor and pleasure of meeting a number of, uh, of individuals who identify as, as long-term survivors or some who like to call themselves long-term thrivers. Uh, nothing but huge respect and, uh, and gratitude for long-term survivors as someone newly infected. But I'm wondering, what what do you what do you attest to the fact that um, that you made it? You know what I mean. I, 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 
I'm, I mean, I haven't a clue. This is, I can only think that my parents must have given me a good set of genes. Right. Because, like, kind of, you know, there, 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 there seems to be no reason, you know, why I should have survived and other people didn't, I, except that, that I suppose that I made certain choices or I was allowed to make certain choices. So, for instance, there was the Concord program that we had over here, which was when they were, were testing the use of AZT. And essentially, AZT, we later learn, is a failed chemotherapy drug. At right. that point, we didn't know, you know that that was the case. But what they were doing was that they were giving people three grams of this poison in the course of a day. So right. a gram in the morning, a gram in the afternoon, and a gram in the evening. I mean, when AZT, you know, then got used, it was 0.125 milligrams. And, you know, what happened with, with or happens with, you know, old chemotherapy drugs is that they wipe out your immune system. They're wiping out the cancer, but they wipe everything out. So right. it leaves you open to any opportunistic infection that, that's around. Anyway, um, I was asked if I would, would join the, this trial. And they were explaining that you have a cohort and you cut it in half and then one half gets the placebo and the other half gets the pill. So I said, well, um, do you kind of um, match people up, pair people up so that someone who's got a kind of sim similar build to myself or similar metabolism as, as I, we're paired up and then one of us gets the pill, one of us gets the placebo. And they went, oh, no, that's far too complicated. And I just saw red. <laughs> and I got a bit belligerent. And I said, well, now, I said, if you could put a plank down the middle of me and you give me one half the pill and the other half the placebo and we see which half does best, that I think is a trial. But if you can't be bothered to do that, I can't be bothered to do your trial. And I actually think that by not taking the AZT, that's one of the reasons that I am still here, because most of the people who took AZT, either they just couldn't tolerate it and they, they stopped, or it, it, it just opened them up to all the opportunistic infections and right. they went. So, yeah, I know, uh, I, I know your character in the movie uh, makes a, a comment and, and attributes it to, uh, um, to smoking cannabis as yeah, yeah. Uh, what yeah, may well, have. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know I'm my antiretrovirals, but I'm still going with that therapy as well. And so okay. far, it's been working great no, no, for no. me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see. I mean, you look glowing, glowing. Um, so tell me, we, we, we know what happened um, up to 84, 85 in Jonathan Blake's life. What about, yeah. uh, about post-movie times? Well, post-movie times, basically... Um, what happened was that, 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 you know, I was out of work and unemployed and um, the leader of the, the Greater London Council was a man called Ken Livingstone. Um, and Ken Livingstone ran London. He ran the Greater London Council. The, the GLC were directly opposite the House of Parliament. Thatcher hated them. You know, he was <laughs> Red Ken. But he had this amazing policy that if you were out of work and unemployed, you could pay one pound and for the whole year, you could do any number of, of courses at any of the other education centers. There was places like Morley College or City Lit um, or any other education place. And it was just, it was incredible. And so Nigel and I would go off and we would do things. And, and one day he and a friend of his, uh, Barry Prothero, we're going off to do a trouser making class. And I said, oh, that sounds fun. Can I come along? Of course, the more the merrier. So we waltz off to a, an adult education place just not far from, from where I live, or where we live, um, in a place called the Strand Institute. And it was up on the fifth floor. It was a, an old school building. And the fifth floor was where the old science laboratories used to be. So the tables were, were big and tall. And there was this lovely elderly Jewish tailor called Harry. And the first thing that Harry said was, I want you to all sit cross-legged on the table, because that's how tailors used to sit. They'd have a board on their lap 
on a table. My father used to sell furniture. If you ever sat on the table, you were screamed at, get off a table, chairs are sitting on not table. So with one phrase, Harry had given me permission. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the table, you know, doing my tatting, doing my, my sewing. And I think, how many pairs of trousers do I need? What I really need to do is learn how to make a pattern. And somebody pipes up, oh, they do that at the London College of Fashion down at Shoreditch. So I thought, right. I'll go down to London College of Fashion. I've paid my pound. So down I went and I enrolled for, for a pattern making class. Loved it. And while I was doing that, one of the tutors said, oh, by the way, we do this three year city and guild diploma in tailoring. Might you be interested? And I thought, I'll be dead before I finish that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it would keep me busy, keep me occupied. The strike is over. So I enrolled. And I was able to get a grant from, from the councils that they weren't loans, they were, they were still grants. Um, and so I did it. Wonderful story. I, I, I am so grateful for the time that you've taken with us today to, uh, to bring us um, a little up to date on, uh, on the Jonathan Blake story. I know there's more and uh, I do hope that you'll be able to uh, share some more of your story with us in the uh, very near future. Um, sorry, my timer just went off saying that we are running out of time for the show. Um, oh, listen, thank so, you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, for me, absolutely a great pleasure. I am, uh, uh, once again, I just want to tell you how, uh, how grateful I am that you've taken the time to be with us. Uh, um, your story is, is inspirational. I, I, for one, am incredibly um, happy that you are still with us surviving and, and living a fabulous life with HIV, both you and Nigel. And, uh, um, and, and again, I just, uh, I wanna thank you for all that you have done uh, for me and other folks living with HIV right across the globe, just by, by living and, and being you and, and showing us that, uh, you know, this is um, an, a chronic illness that we can all live with and manage and, uh, and, and I'm grateful that I, I feel like I have the opportunity to call Jonathan Blake my friend now. And uh, that means the world to me, Jonathan. So thank you once again for being on the show this evening. I do hope you'll come back for a future episode. And thank all of you for watching another episode of Let's Be Perfectly Queer. <laughs>